The world can seem upside down at times, which has set me on a journey in search for love, truth, and ultimately personal freedom. I'm on a mission to help people find peace and healing so that each of us as individuals and ultimately the collective can be free from whatever keeps us stuck and skews our view of just how beautiful this life can be. Welcome to The Lucas Mack Show. Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome back to another episode of the Lucas Mack Show. I am Lucas Mack. This episode is my very first time recording with a guest in this room. I have Nick Bradley on, who's a physician assistant, has an incredible story, talks about his journey of being the head of the physician assistants in the United States Army as a lieutenant colonel, uh, his journey of leaving the military, and what he's doing now in a pediatrics clinic. Uh, in the DFW area in Texas. And it's an incredible story. I affectionately call him Dr. Nick, and he's an incredible man with a passion for truth, a passion for health, and a passion for all of us to return back to the God-given divine right of our bodies to be healthy in alignment with this earth. So without delay, Brother Nick, thank you for coming on and everyone enjoy. Brother, first of all, congratulations on being the very first <laughs> in-person interview in this office. Um, everyone, I'm excited, like I said in the intro, to have Dr. I call you Dr. Nick. Yeah. That's that's my term of endearment. You can explain your real medical background in, sure. in a moment. And I gave a high-level intro uh, to you. But before we get into what you're doing today, give us some background of how, you know, that journey that took you into what you're doing today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's been, it's 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 been I think an amazing journey, mm. uh, no doubt about it. And I think uh, you you always think you come to a, a culmination point, and then some life gives you something else. But no, wait, this is the culmination. No, this is the culmination. Mm. And I I think I feel like I'm in one of those culmination moments. You know, I mean, meeting you, yeah, Aaron, yeah, uh, just the brothers we've met out here, yes. and what brought us all here from that background has been absolutely amazing. So I I think you know going back in my life, I think it starts prior to military service, mm. just kind of. Because that's where I think I started developing those culmination moments. Like, okay, this is it. I've arrived. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, high school, typical kid, party, uh, made, it, made a decision that it was more fun to hang out with people than it was to actually learn something. Mm. And probably my benefit, because I don't know if the public school system does a very good job at actually teaching anybody anything. Right. Um, right. Uh, but at any rate, had a great time in school. I got to a point in life where it was the Army or follow that path that mm. leads to a, a jail cell. I mean, I was making bad decisions. Mm. Um, we had a a moment where I rolled a buddy's car on the main drag of Salt Lake City. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, at that moment in life, I realized I dumped all my savings into a lawyer to keep me out of jail. And I said, and my dad said, hey, you got to figure it out. Wow. I mean, you're at that moment. So I literally walked to my recruiter in 1996 and I think he was as shocked as I was during Pete's time. This was Clinton time. Yeah. You know, yeah. they were doing more people getting out of the service and going in. And when I walked in and said, hey, I, I'm interested, he, it blew his mind. And then, you know, one thing led to another. I entered on active duty. I did some time enlistment, had an opportunity to commission and switched over, commissioned. Wow. Then I, I was an engineer for uh, for several years. And um, during one of my deployments, I uh, befriended our doc. Mm. You know, our, our, our unit doc. Yeah. And I saw what he was doing. And I said, buddy, you, what you're doing is uh, utterly amazing. Mm. And he said, uh, well, I'm a, I'm a PA. And he said, you, you can do this if you want. You know, we have, there's a track program in the service. You can, you could see if you qualify, you know, there's some schooling, you got to have background. And, and I looked at my, my transcripts from, from college. And I realized I did a lot of that pre-med. Wow. I did already a lot of that cool. stuff. And um, that, that's what took me into being a physician assistant is I did the inner service physician assistant program through the army, mm. amazing program, rigorous program, yeah. definitely a crucible moment in life of realizing like, man, this is hard. You know, you, you get through it. It's going to pay off dividends and it has. Um, so that's, you know, I did end up transition over, finished out my career as a PA and then in uh, 2000 and, and as a Lieutenant Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel. Yeah. Don't, yeah. Don't well, that out. That's, yeah. that's impressive. Man. Yeah. So I, in 2019, uh, I made the decision. I told my wife, I always told my wife that, you know, if I'm, if 
I wake up in the morning and I and I don't feel it, then it's time to go. Mm. And you know, all throughout my career, I never felt that. I, I felt like we have a mission, we have a job. Yeah. And I think you know the deployments, the time, and and the the lack of fruit, all of that bore in the end just kind of wore me down. I said, you know, one morning I got up and said, I, I don't, I don't know if I can do this anymore. Mm. And I gave it some time. And at the time, I was chief of a clinic in Alaska, and um. And, and I decided I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna submit my retirement. And I was early, you know, I was early in my promotion, lieutenant colonel. I had a whole career ahead of me, you know, a, a leadership track I could take yeah. and do a lot of different things. It had been good things. I mean, it, it I think where I'd gone there would have been great as well. Yeah. Um, but I, I was done at that point. I said it, it's time. I had a, at the time I had a very young daughter, mm. and she was four, and I wanted to kind of see her life out. She was the first child I had that I was able to see grow from zero to four. Mm -hmm. All my other children, I spent time deployed or I'd be away on field exercise or whatever training. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get to see them. I missed a big portion of early development. And this was the first time I got to see that. And I thought, you know, I don't want to miss this. Mm -hmm. I'm done missing out on my daughters, my kids' yeah. uh, development. Yeah. And so I decided I submitted my retirement. This so happened to coincide, you know, the year before COVID happened. Timing couldn't have been even more perfect, yeah. in my opinion, because what my brothers went through during that time is something fierce. Um, but at any rate, uh, retired out. And then uh, we built a little modest kind of quasi homestead in Alaska. I started doing some urgent care work all through the the the, the quote unquote pandemic. Um, and then really transition, I think, you know, I want to go back a little bit. And yeah. I, in 2018 in my career, because I think this is going to kind of feed into some stuff we talk about. But in 2018, I had a paradigm shift in terms of medicine. And I read a book, it was called uh, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration by Dr. Weston Price, old book. Um, and in that book, it kind of opened my eyes to the idea of disease and what disease really is. Mm. And at the same time, I think it was almost like a, a, a perfect moment where we had an incident happen with vaccination with a soldier that opened my paradigm in vaccines. And, and that kind of shifted a little bit of what I thought I knew. But fast forward to, to 2020, when that happened, at that time, I was transitioning out of the service, working in urgent care. And I wasn't seeing this, what everybody else was seeing. It didn't make sense to me. Yeah. And I was seeing it front, front lines, you know, in an urgent care center in downtown Anchorage. Um, wasn't seeing what we were being told we were seeing, right. what was happening, wasn't right. what I've seen happening. During so, that time, just to interject, right. during that time, I was in Seattle and the news is just making it like you know, because we were ground zero of the Evergreen Hospital right. in Kirkland, and I was actually in Bellevue. We were living there. They were making it sound like, you know, bodies are dropping everywhere. Right. So I drove to Overlake Hospital, the largest hospital on the east side of, there was no one. But they had the signage for lines, and they had zero. Right. Zero people. That's right. I was like, that's right. What? Yeah, that's right. They did. Uh, and, I, and I saw it with the hospital, same thing. Mm. Same thing, firsthand. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um so at any rate, I, I decided to go back to school. Mm. And in 2020, I had uh, fortunately I had a job where, um, you know, in urgent care, you work if work is there. You right. know, pa patients are coming in. We didn't have any kind of, I mean, the, nobody, nobody's lying up out the doors. Right. Um, and then most of our clinics shut down because out of caution, we had to protect the workforce. Right. But, uh, you know, I stayed working. Um, so I had time to read and really, really expand my mind into medicine. Mm. And um, I was introduced to a, a lot of members that are now part of the, the supposed health freedom movement. Um, but they they were at least a, a critical piece of that, of that development and that growth for me during that time frame. Mm. Um, so, you know, at that time, I was shifting away from just that modern thinking of, of medicine, yeah. you know, a modern approach, you know, disease, medicine, disease, right. medicine, right. disease, medicine. Um, and it didn't, it didn't make sense. And I never saw any value in that. And really looking back in my career, the, the stuff that had value is the stuff that we got to change, you know, in acute care, trauma medicine, we got to change something. We had to affect something right there. Got to right. stop a bleed, right. right? Save a life. You know, you got to reset a bone, right? You know, you know, these, these things, these things affect change. When people came to you said, I'm sick. I don't feel right. Something's going on. Medicine. Right. Here's your medicine. I didn't, didn't do anything. You know, looking back, it's like, man, I just wasted my time. I was right. spinning my wheels. So, you know, I, I ended up kind of transitioning out. I found an opportunity to work with a small clinic that did, you know, what they called integrated medicine mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, functional, what they call, uh, they could put labels on it all day. Uh, so I, I basically was self-study. I felt like I was going through my PhD mm. from 2020 up to 2022, 
right around the midpoint there when I finally landed a, uh, an opportunity to start really working with patients and figuring out what the crux of the problem was, really what was making you ill, thinking differently about their life, like really listening and going into depth on their past. Mm. And I found, man, there was so much more value when I got to sit in an appointment and listen to them and have that time for them to just lay it on me. Mm. Because you can then take that, synthesize, and start picking out parts in history. Like, wait, there's there's a part. Yeah. There's something that matters. Yeah. There's something that matters. So instead of you know compressing it into a 15, 20-minute appointment saying, what's your symptoms? And, okay, here's the algorithm. Here's your here's your, your treatment set. We'll see you later. Yeah. Uh, here's the specialist, the specialty you go to, right? Everything is just reduced down to a body part the way we think about medicine today. Yeah. Oh, you got a headache. Well, it, it's going to be in neurology, right? Maybe, maybe we got something going on in the endocrine system. Maybe we got something going on there else, but it's always a specialty. Mm. It's not the whole body. Right. So um, that was an education into itself. So I did that for about uh, about seven, eight months. And then, you know, we made a decision for my daughter. Uh, we wanted to give her a better education opportunity than we had going on in Alaska and understanding you know, we pulled my daughter out of the system yeah. and we started homeschooling in 2020. And we've been doing that ever since. You know, my daughter is a, a social butterfly mm. and you take a social butterfly, you pull her from yeah. the population, you yeah. throw her in confinement, not a place to watch her blossom. Mm. And as, as well as she did and as educated she wa uh, was getting, uh, she just wasn't blossoming. She missed that interaction, that social interaction. So yeah. I thought, well, can't I'm not going to go back into the system. So we got to find something better because Alaska just didn't have that opportunity. So yeah. we had to give up our homestead. And I thought that was the be all end all for Nick Bradley. I thought we'd settle out in Alaska. I do my hunt, my hunt, my camp and my fishing, yeah. my harvesting. Yeah, this was it. You know, I, I made it. I've arrived. You know, that wasn't the Lord had different plans for me and mm -hmm. definitely made his presence known in the decision to come to Texas. And not only come to Texas, but come to Texas and do pediatric medicine yeah. for an integrated clinic. And, and then going from a background, coming from a background where I never saw kids, mm. right? Maybe in the urgent care setting to bring kids in. Yeah. But ultimately, you know, from the service, it was all pretty much healthy adults, yeah. you know, 18, 50 years old. That was my patient population. So my background in pediatrics was nothing. So I was intimidated up front thinking, my goodness, what do I do with the, mm. with the little one? You yeah. know, I, I, I don't know if this is the... This is going to be the right fit for me, but yeah. it the, the Holy Spirit spoke and said you're going, and I said okay, and Amazing. who's who's to turn them down? Amazing, right? Amazing, and you end up at a place called Shine Pediatrics, yeah. which oh. is shining light, shining light where there's a lot of darkness. Absolutely, and these families are responding. Yes, they are. What? Um, when did so? You said 2018 was a catalyst moment for you to wake up. 2020 yeah. was a catalyst moment yeah. for you to wake up. But uh, you know, when did you? When was the the last straw for you where you knew like there you're the people that were gonna believe that or believe in and they're going down that path and you decided I'm not gonna go down that path yeah. anymore? That's a great question. I think it was when I was working in urgent care mm. in Alaska. Now understand Alaska, there's uh the mentality there, many of the folks are just fiercely independent. Yeah, right. People yeah. go to Alaska for a reason. You know, we say there are two types of Alaskans, those that ran to Alaska and those that ran from the lower 48. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. and I ran to Alaska. Yeah. You know, this was this is what I wanted. You know, yeah. this is this is beauty and everything and all the, you know, the the the, the adult playground of the world. Yeah. I got hunt, I got fishing, I got hiking, I got what I want, I got the beauty. Right. There's that connection. Um, but they're fiercely independent. All my coworkers. Were of, most of them were of that mentality. Mm. You know, I, I took as like independent-minded individuals. The company I work for is a major hospital organization out of actually based out of Seattle, mm. a major hospital. And they were the biggest healthcare supplier in the state of Alaska. That's who I worked for. <laughs> and throughout the process, they started talking about, you know, in 2021, the shot was coming. And you know, I saw it beforehand. Yeah. Like, that's not going to, because I learned in 2018, that ain't gonna save you, right? Right. That that's not what it's about. Um, but that you know, they start talking about you know, hey, we're gonna wait to the injection because the whole time I'm I'm trying to put together care plans like, hey, we we need to figure out how to help these people. Yeah, right. You know, folks are sick, they're scared. Right. Well, what are we doing? We're just telling them to go home and wait till they turn blue. Yeah. And then go to the emergency room. That's not helping people. Right. So I I you know I briefed the um, the department heads 
uh, for the urgent care setting in, in the organization I work for. I actually did a vir- virtual uh, conference. I put together a whole briefing mm. and I was following the advice of the FLCC at the time. They were putting out some good information. I read some literature that McCullough was pro- producing at the time. Mm. So I was deep diving all these ideas about, hey, wait, we, we can do a lot with vitamin supplementation. You know, yeah. this is my mindset at the time. And I will tell yeah. you, it's evolved. Yeah, long I know. I heard that. it the other night. Oh, I actually... Oh, yeah. we thought everything in my cabinet. Yeah, yeah, I've evolved. But yeah. I mean, but at the time, I'm looking at, hey, these are things that we can do now. Mm. People can do now. And that was coming from a mentality of being in the service where you're presented with problems now. Right. Right. And you may not have trained for that solution, but you're going to find a solution. Mm. And that is just the mentality of the service. You know, I learned that a long time ago that you're not given everything you need to go be successful. Not all the time. Right. You got to do what you got to do best with what you got mm. and you got to figure it out. You got to develop many courses of action. Yeah. You got to synthesize, you got to break it down and then you make a decision and go. That's right. So, you know, here we found out we were just in this, this, this mud. We were stuck. We we're in a quagmire. We were like, no decision. The only decision is go home. I said, that's not a decision. Right. And we're healthcare providers. People are looking at us, coming to us for help. Right. And we're telling him there is no help. There is no hope. But later on, we said, oh, wait, wait till the vaccine. Mm. That's the, that's going to be the solution. That didn't make sense to me. Right. We can do a lot up until then. So, I, you know, I briefed, um, a, you know, a protocol, some ideas that I had. And I provide all the literature. I backed it up. Doctors love literature. Yeah. You know, they like yeah. to look and look at literature. Yeah. At least that's what I thought. That's what the system <laughs> operated off. It's right. literature. How many papers do you have? What, what's the p-value of your papers and uh, all this smart stuff right you know these are smart guys so i provided all that to them and they didn't read none of it when i did the briefing they had a decision in mind before i even opened my mouth mm. and as soon as that briefing was done it's like yep thank you very much we'll we'll consider and we'll move on and we'll get back to you guys nothing ever came back mm. but pestered my boss and said hey what are we doing what are we doing are we doing budesonide can i prescribe hydroxychloroquine yeah you know can we prescribe ivermectin yeah. Can we start doing something for these guys and said no no. So um, that was a moment where I was getting, acting, by the way, uh, Nobel Prize, the person right. who invented it won the Nobel Prize. Right. You know, I mean, it's so yeah. insane. Right. Yeah. No, no, it's it's on its surface, on on the face. And, you know, I, I think uh, um, I like to think of myself, you know, we, we talk about the ists. There's mm-hmm. a lot of ists running around right now. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and do you have. You have the backing. You have the bona fides to even speak to something like right. this. Well, I'm a common sensitist. Not hard to see the surface. <laughs> yeah. I've been using this thing for a long dang time. Yeah. Right. Billions of people taking this thing. Yeah. Right. We've prescribed far worse. I was prescribing hydroxychloroquine in Afghanistan. Wow. I was prescribing that to troops on routinely for malaria prophylaxis. I knew the safety profile. Never had anybody come back to me with any problems with hydroxychloroquine. Right. So I knew that right off the bat. That was fine. Like that, you know, it, it's in the end, it's a synthetic. I'd rather you eat. And develop and, and build sure, your right, immunity the right. right way. But if if we got a problem right. and I got to give something to somebody to help them out that I see that has value, I'm going to give them that value. But Neil Cavuto on Fox said it's really dangerous. Yeah, so you should be careful. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Thank thank for yeah. Yeah. guys Thanks, like Neil Cavuto. Yeah. 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 Uh, clowns. <laughs> but at any rate, um, uh, yeah. That so that that was right at kind of that culminating moment. Like this is not making sense. Mm. This is this is starting to irritate me because you know I'd sit down with patients. And the moment I told them that, hey, this test, yeah. which by the way, that's a whole different conversation, but this test tells you have COVID. I always tell them, caveat that with, look, it's a test that doesn't diagnose a disease. Yeah. It's diagnosing genetic material. Doesn't mean this is what you have. So I don't want you to go think you are and defined by COVID. Yeah. It says this. Because as soon as you told them, it was almost like giving somebody a death sentence. Yeah. They, they scared it. people into, I mean, I'd have patients break down and cry, mm. think that this is it. They can do nothing anymore. This is it's over for them. Mm. That they're going to become a statistic. And I, and I have to tell them, like, look, no, 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 no. You understand that they, you're you're in an age group where you've got a ninety nine point nine 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 right. percent chance of survival. Right. Like you, your chance of getting struck by lightning in Alaska is far greater. We don't have lightning. Like that doesn't happen, or rarely. But the point is, you're you're. It, I mean, actually, I take it back. It does happen, but it's not a common stance. Like sure, in, in I Texas. understand what you're saying. Yeah, but see, it's not. It's, you're you're okay. Um, but it was it was it, that's what it was. Mm. It was just fear campaign. So when they started talking about the rollout, I thought that I'd have you know the people I work with like we'd stand up, say no, we're not we're not going to play this. Like we we you guys were in this. Yeah. So the, the culminating moment for me was when. 
I observe what I consider fiercely independent individuals or independent individuals, people that I can think through. Because we talked. I'd have a colleague talk all the time. We dialogue about this is, you know, this ain't this ain't what it is. Yeah. We're, we're seeing something totally different. We yeah. know this ain't what it is. And I thought that, you know, they they presented the same picture that, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, absolutely. And we yeah. we talk and banter back and forth. But as soon as they put the mandate in the hospital, they dropped the mandate. I said, no. And every one of my colleagues walked in line and they got it. Yeah. And I said, well, there it is. And I said, I'll be darn. Yeah. These aren't what I thought they were. Yeah. Same. And I think it was more yeah. and more people that you thought would do the thing and yes. say no. Yes. They lined up and got it. Dude, I have to say, I am just now in the past few months forgiven people. And that this is four years later. Right. This is a long time later, three years later. And I was so angry. And I I thought everyone's a coward. I've lost friends over it because of how, what I said. I mean, um, man, no, I just thought, not. how could I be the only one I know in in my peer group and my work? How is it? This is insane. I would go to, I would every Saturday maybe for four or five months, every Saturday, I'd go to Home Depot, I'd stand outside, and I would see if anyone would enter Home Depot without a mask. Just a mask. I'm going to talk about the shop. Sure. Just a mask. <clears throat> and I'd see these massive, you know, big construction, butt-kicking looking dudes. Mm-hmm. Carhartt, tough. They walk out of, they get out of their truck they walk, so I'm leaning up against one of the posts, you know, before you go into the store. And I just watch people for hours because there's nothing else really to do at the time, you know. So I'd go to Home Depot, watch, see these big men, and I'm like, I get so excited. Guys coming 20 feet from the door, no mask on, and goes in his pocket and puts it on. So I would follow these men without a mask into the store, walk all around. And no one would ever say a thing to me. And then I'd walk out and I thought, how am I the only, the only one? I'm not exaggerating. I never saw someone without a mask on except a blonde woman the month we moved from Seattle to Texas. I never saw one That's human amazing. being without a mask in the whole Seattle area. That's wild. Crazy. Yeah. How is it? I don't, I, I just, I so know. I was so angry and felt so betrayed because all it just took was a few to say, yeah. No, that's right. (laughs) No. (laughs) And that's where I get really fired up. No, but no one else would do it. And you can't be one voice. I mean, you can be one voice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But you're not going to make a lot of change just with one voice. No. And and, and not only that, it's a lonely path. It certainly is. And that, and (laughs) a lonely life. Yeah. It's a, it's a lonely path. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, you, you, you bring up, you know, when I, when that happened and I saw that, and then, you know, at that point, you know, they, they, they had excuse. I'd ask them, I, I'd put them on the line. So why, why'd you do it? Yeah. Why'd you do that? And, you know, they, they'd have, they'd have an excuse. Well, you know, I got to make them, well, I'm, I'm still here. Yeah. I've same. been fired. Yeah. Same. I'm, they're not, they, you know, they're not, you know, they, they, you know, they came after and said, you got to submit, you know, your religious exemption. They were firing people. Yeah. They wouldn't fire me. So I wrote a letter mm. to the CEO of this hospital organization, and I fired it to his email. I was mad. Mm. And I went in this letter, and I read the Nuremberg Code. Mm. And I went and read Title 21, Section 3, I think it's 360 BBB dash. I, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but Title 21 actually gave us protection. It's also where the emergency use authorization comes from, Title 21. Mm. So it's already statutory that we have protection. Mm. We have the Nuremberg Code. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, you have, an, a, this is this is an, a, an experimental Drug. Right. We have the Tuskegee experiments. I mean, come on, colleagues. Yes. We've done this before. We know what our rights are. Yeah. As human beings. Right. And yeah. um, I wrote this letter, and bro- brother, it was it was ter- terse. It was sharp. I mean, and I wrote a lot in the military. A lot of letters and things that in the military were were bluff. Bottom line, up front. Mm, right, that's good. Yeah, decorate yeah, yeah. things. It's, yeah. it, give me the bluff, you know, because we ain't got time to yeah. dance around. And, and I laid it out. 
I, I put it out in one concise paper mm. and I put it out there. I put it out there and I sent that email to him. Never heard a word back. Talked wow. to my department head, said, oh, it's in the legal department. Wow. So at any rate, they fired folks. They did lay people, our fire folks, for not getting the injection. Yeah. But they didn't fire me yet. And I kept getting badgered by my boss. You got to please fill out a religious exemption. Please fill out a religious exemption. Mm. And at the time, you know, I'm, I, you know, I, I think I look back at my, you know, we'll probably have that conversation. But I look back at my, my, my spiritual development yeah. in life, and I always had a belief in God. But there was a lot of questions. Mm. In my yeah. experiments, uh, or experience, a lot of questions. And experiments, yeah, experiments, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> no, no doubt. Um, but certainly, certainly, you know, the deployed setting yeah. and listen to chapless bless us before going off and people killing people. I'm like, yeah. this doesn't make sense. Right. This is not God. Right. Um, so, you know, um, you know, when they, they kept badgering me, badgering me. So I went, that's okay. Okay. I'll fill this thing out. So I go online. I look at this thing and they want details, scripture, yeah. you know, kind of quote, when I put in there, none of your business, this is between me and my God, yeah. not you. Yeah. You're not my judge. Yeah. Um, and, and I put it all in there. So I basically just basically told them F off. So yeah. that's it. I'm not, not going to get any more in this. So I sent that. And lo and behold, I get word back a couple of weeks later from my, my media boss, who, by the way, I got along with real well. Mm -hmm. You know, she was an ultra liberal, but she loved how I worked. And we got, we, we hit it off when I first started there. So she had kind of a liking towards me. Yeah. And I think, you know, it could have been different if she didn't like me, but she, she did. Um, but she comes back and goes, Nick, I'm, I'm, uh, you got to accept you're good to go. They, they're not going to, they're, they're going to, they accepted your religious exemption. Wow. I mean, this is after I know people that got fired and I sit down. No, I didn't. That's not, you know, no. Uh, and I was, I knew at that moment I'm done. And that, that I think you, the long answer to your question mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. that was the straw that yeah. going through that experience with my colleagues, because that point, you know, we didn't have that relationship no more. Mm. And, you know, I like to think, I like to tell myself I did then that was them. You know, they, they're the ones that turned their back on me. Mm. No, it wasn't. It mm. was me. Yeah. It was. Because I said, you gave in. Yeah. And deep inside of me, I didn't want any part of that. That's right. <laughs> and I didn't want that connection with you no more. Yeah. Because when it mattered, you weren't there. Yeah, you weren't there. You weren't there. So um, at that point, I knew my time was done and I quit the job. And at that, you know, that moment when I quit that job, I had no job lined up. I hadn't interviewed for a job, hadn't looked around for nothing, mm. literally just threw it out there. And I said, you got my notice. I'm out in two weeks. Wow. And I said, that's that's it. I can't stay here. I got to share a story real quick. Just interject. It, when I was in sixth grade, I was at a movie theater. Was, I grew up in this town where it was just a two theater movie theater, mm -hmm. a little tiny two screens. And I'm with a buddy that was on my baseball team. He was in fifth grade. I was in sixth grade. And we come out of the movies. And these two eighth grade uh, grew up next to Indian reservation and the Indian reservation, they, those guys would always fight the white kids and they would jump and there was always fights. Right. So these two, three native guys come up and two eighth graders and they're big and they said they're in eighth grade, but they're probably in high school in the actual grade of eighth grade. You know, these are probably 17 year olds in eighth grade, mm -hmm. if you know what I'm saying. These are big kids. And uh, there's a six, little kid, sixth grader, they said, and they and I'm with the, my buddy and they come up and they start pushing me and they just pick on me. And they're, and I'm like, I'm going to get jumped right now by these guys. And like, you think you can fight him? You think you can fight him? I'm like, I don't want to fight him because if I fought the, that kid, they were going to jump up mm -hmm. and get me. So I look around and my buddy ran off. He wasn't even around. I don't even know what he, he was literally <laughs> right behind me. And when I looked, I was the only one there. And I was never friends with that guy after that day. Yeah. But also a cool story is they were looking at me and I don't know what happened to this day. I have no idea. But they these eight graders looked at me and they stopped in their tracks and they go, this kid's sick. Let's get out of here. And they walked away and left me alone. And I was by myself and I had to walk home a couple of miles. And I just shared that story. Someone said, maybe they saw your angels. I don't know. But they said, mm. this kid's sick. Let's get out of here. Mm. And uh, anyway, I only just share that story is. You know, you think your buddy's there with you, when, you know, when stuff goes down yeah. and look, oh, when, when did you leave? I don't even know, but right. you were never there. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, no, no doubt. I just have to share that story. No, no. I think that, that it, it's, it is exactly right. When it matters most. Yeah. Right? right. When it matters most. Yeah. And it can be as little as, I mean, a fight, right? I mean, it, something as innocuous as, yeah. as that you're getting right. picked up at that point. 
he, my goodness, I can imagine when the really chips mattered, right? right Where's right, he going to be? Right. Right? He's been long, long gone. Exactly. So, I exactly. mean, um, and I want to say also, it, I, just a, as an affirmation to you and everyone that's listened and listening, one of the things, you know, I think we grow up as kids and we see these, we read the hero stories and we watch mm-hmm. the movies. And, and I always was like, am I that person? I, I, you know, you, uh, you deployed in combat, you know who you are because you're put in that ultimate test, but most people were never put in that ultimate test. I certainly had, and I had in the abuse in that intensity, but that was something that was like an interpersonal battle that I had, but man, I really am the person that I hoped I would be. Cause I literally said no to everyone and everything. And I was so proud of myself after like, yeah. dude, I am the person, I, I, you know, I don't know. And I'm, really beautiful way there that's one of the biggest silver linings that came out of it is you know when i i was shaking this desk you know i'm in seattle and i get selected for jury duty and and there's 40 people on the call we're on a zoom call and the judge has a mask on on the zoom call and it's crazy and and he said if you're selected you have to come in person and uh we require everyone wear Mm -hmm. a mask does anyone have an issue with that again some big looking strong masculine looking dudes like beards like yours you know Mine was a little thinner at the time. I, tried. I mean, guys, I'm like, I'm the only one that raised my hand. And the judge goes, well, what, what problem do you have wearing a mask? And I said, I don't believe in them. I've never worn one and I will not wear one. <laughs> when I said I will not wear one, you could feel just even through that Zoom call. Okay. He leaned in and he's dead eyed on me. And he goes, what if I order you to? And in that moment, my leg's shaking. You know, he can't see me. Because mm-hmm. I, I put my desk in standing mode so yeah. I can at least get the energy out and I'm not sitting there. But my leg's shaking and I break eye contact. I think I might have shared this the other night, but I break eye contact just so it wasn't looking like he and I are like locked in because mm-hmm. it wasn't going to be a pissy match, match like that. But I moved my head down, looked back up at him and said, I don't want to break the law, but I do not believe in them and I will not wear one. And he said, I'll take note of that. And man, that was one of the scariest moments I've had to go through. Yeah. And I did it <laughs> and I'm freaking proud of myself. So I'm proud of you. I'm proud of all these people. What a, what an honorable experience that we got to have for ourselves to walk through this journey. No, so I, I just want to affirm yeah. you in that to say, no, I'm out of here. Yeah. You can pack it where the sun don't shine. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, I think that, I, you know, I always told my son, you know, we, we, we talk about when, when, when do we become men, right? Mm. 26 years of age, apparently your prefrontal cortex is set. So yeah, you're, you're right. an adult at that point. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, yeah. you're a man. As soon as, you know, you, you're, you're born, your gender's affirmed. You're right. You know. <laughs> right. Right. You know, you, you think about these things and I, I look over my career and I, I think, man, I, you know, I've had a lot of moments in my career where I wasn't proud of myself. Mm. I didn't look at myself and say, man, I'm, I can look in the mirror and say, thank you. know, Good job, Nick. You did, mm-hmm. you did great. I mean, in, in my life, yeah. you know, yeah. my you know, going back to high school and, 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 you know, rolling that vehicle on state street. Mm-hmm. I came from that where I didn't want to fess up to it, man. We didn't, nobody told the cops what happened that mm-hmm. night. I was scared. Yeah. You know, I was scared. Yeah. So they got me on a false statement because I didn't tell them I was driving that night. And certainly, you know, person of the influence. I mean, it was a bad, it was bad decisions I made as a kid. Um, you know, I look back at that and I was like, man, I was a coward. It's a coward. Um, hmm. you know, going through the service at times, you know, when we, you, 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 you go do the confidence courses and yeah. you look at the big, the big obstacles and you're like, ah, oh, I don't know, man. You know, you, you, you get gut checked and you yeah. end up doing yeah. it. And after you're done, like, oh, that wasn't, that wasn't as bad. Yeah. Wasn't as bad. And, you know, you build up. And I think that my life, I look at my life, it was a build up becoming a man hmm. because when you're faced with something that takes your livelihood away from you and yes. you don't be, you're not afraid of that. That's right. That's the moment that I think defines us. Um, and I, you know, I'd sit there and I think, because I lost a lot of brothers in the service. I don't talk to anybody in the service no more because wow. they gave in. Yeah. But I don't know what I would have done. I, I'd like to think I'd have done the same thing. Mm. You know, I got brothers that were 16, 17, 18 years into a career. And you got that retirement lean over. You put yeah. that much time in and they're telling you, we'll, we'll kick you to the curb. You know, and and really, they have no legal standing to do it. None. Right. And we're learning that. Right. They learn that. Right. You know, we have, they have protection. Right. But they'll scare you into that, and then they'll they'll pull other maneuvers like you can't take leave. Mm. We're not going to allow you to transition out of this installation and go to a new one. So mm. you'd be miserable stuck in an installation you don't like. Right. And they'll say we're not going to move you. 
you're going to be withheld from promotion until you make that decision. Do it. There's all these other factors they can do to put the screws to you mm. when you're in the service. So my brothers that gave in and did it, right? Um, I don't know if I blame them entirely for doing right. that. Yeah. And I don't know what I would have done. I like to think I'd have done the same thing because I knew it was wrong. Yeah. I knew it was wrong. You know, whether or not it worked or not at the time didn't matter. Mm. Doesn't matter. That's not the argument. Right. It's when you don't give an individual a choice, and especially a choice to what to do with their own body. That's right. And that and that right there, you've you've already breached yeah. that that comp that level of 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 trust. Mm. Um, and I don't know. I don't know. I, I, and I think though, I look back and I'm proud. I am. Yeah. I am definitely, I'm glad, you know, I came out roses where I'm at today. It's, it's been a blessing. Yes. Um, no doubt about it. Um, but I lost a lot of friends. I don't, you know, my, my phone shrunk in terms of going on contact lists. Yeah. I've kind of eliminated some over time. Just yeah. don't talk to nobody anymore. And it's what it is, you know, and I've met new brothers and, yeah. and it's like, it's, it's a new chapter in life. And yes. I think that you know, I still think we're in a culmination. You know, we're at a moment in time. We're still, people believe that we've already passed the fork in the road. I disagree. Yeah. That fork is there. Yeah. And we're still having to make that choice. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, the more and more people that are waking up to that and moving away from where the herd is moving, where the herd is going, um, we're going to have that change that we we seek in this world. But, um you know, it's 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 slow rolling when you're one of a million people in yeah. the city you live in, yeah. and I'm one of fifty thousand people in a city I live yeah. in. It's very very you know it takes time to 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 have that awakening happening with so many folks to see what that really meant that moment what that moment really meant because right. it wasn't about an injection right in the end it wasn't about the juice that went in now we can have a whole different conversation about that yeah that's not what it's about that was about you as a human being and the decision you make for humanity yeah and what we do with ourselves right with our with our bodies that's right with our minds that's right right um dietrich bonhoeffer was <clears throat> the last man that adolf hitler ordered to be executed he was in a he was already in a camp and he was the leading uh, Lutheran theologian in Germany. He had actually come to America during uh, the first part of the war and they, and the Americans, and he, I think he met with FDR. FDR was aware that he was here. He was in New York. And a lot of them encouraged him to stay here. Don't go back, you know, right from here. Cause he was a prolific, massive thinker. He was a mm. really huge mind. He wrote, um, yeah, he, he has some books that are just this is a this is like a Luther of the time. Mm. And um, I think the cost of grace, he wrote this book in the concentration camp and he writes in it because at first he wasn't sure. He thought maybe he could just like play the game. And but he wrote not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. Right. And I have never, ever forgotten and that's the last man that Adolf Hitler said, that guy's voice shall be no more. That's right. Yeah, you know, I, I was thinking about this the other day. <laughs> we, I don't want to take you off course so much, but um, you know, when, when this country was founded and New Hampshire's motto was live free or die, <laughs> I'm sure people were like, whoa, <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm all for independence. But what, why do we have to say that? Can't we just negotiate? Can't we just send letters? Can't we be uh, diplomatic? And I said this to a coworker the other day. And I said, I believe in radical transparency over covert diplomacy, period. Mm -hmm. Radical transparency over covert diplomacy. And I think those are the two camps. Mm -hmm. Radical transparency or... We right. Negotiate, weasel, move around. And that's ultimately, I think. And I think also, I also think everyone's here to learn something. So maybe, you know, I don't want to get too woo woo and that, you know, or their past lives. Who knows? Is it a quantum realm and that everything's being chosen at the same time and different timelines? And mm -hmm. I don't know. But ultimately, people came here to play the perfect role 
that they were meant to play in our life. So if everyone did what we did, well, then we wouldn't be, right. you know, but we yeah. were the ones and it's cool that we've yeah. met and there's so many of us and we're kind of sprinkled throughout the world. I meet mm -hmm. people on the podcast and social media and we're all over the place, but we're not really concentrated in an yeah. area. No, we're not. And I, I know it's interesting, but I do think that the, the Holy Spirit has been moving us. Yeah. And yeah. he's putting us in places that we need to be. Yes. And there's, and I, I see it. Mm. And, it, you know, um, I see it through synchronicity. Mm. I see it through synchronicity. I Because I never had synchronicities like I've had since I moved to Texas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. This has been unbelievable. It's amazing. And, yeah, it has been amazing. And, it, I mean, you know, and, and, and coming from, uh, believe me, there's not a day that goes by I don't think about Alaska. Mm. Not a single day. Every day I, I wake up in the morning, I'm like, gosh, I miss it. I miss the air, yeah, miss the, the crisp air, air. Yeah. miss the water, miss the, the, the mountains, just all of it. I'm reaffirmed every day with, with him. Every day. Yeah. It's like, man, you 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 come here, you're you're I go to work, and it's like I always believed that you had to fill your cup. So important for us to fill your cup. Mm. And then and, and you know, we call it R and R in the military. You know, you know, do yep. the work, get yep. some R and R, go, you know, yeah. That's how you just re-energize re for the mission, get back in it, right? Yep. Um I found here that with what I've been had the opportunity to do with, with children, is that I don't get to fill my cup like I did in Alaska. Mm. But when I walk into the clinic and we get in, that's that's the filling. And I think going back to your point, talking about authenticity, transparency, yeah, is when we're open and when we allow that, he'll it, it, we're, we're going to go where we need to be, yeah, where we need to be. But if you're playing the covert diplomacy, if you're playing that, you're not open. Right. You're not open to receive yeah. what where we need to be. Right. So eventually, it will I do believe mm. that there's going to be a paradigm shift, and yes. we're we're where we're going to see more and more brothers and sisters that are among us that, that, that are, that are of like-minded that, that, you know, uh, that are full of love and, 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 and what really matters in this world. Cause yeah. this is an experience we get. Yes. We get this experience in this vessel. Yes. Let's enjoy this. Yes. Let's, let's connect with each other. Let's, let's learn things. Right. And instead we're locked into a competitive state yeah. where we're competing with each other and that scarcity. we're buying. Yeah. yeah. This, yeah. this mentality of there's no abundance, it's scarcity and understand or you're not an economic, you know, and I, I told you about that a while back that the scarcity, it's a concept of fear in yes. the end. It's the opposite polar opposite yes. of spirituality and trusting, trusting what, what he's provided and what he continues to provide. Mm. It's like every time we think it's, Oh, it's going to end. Oh, it ain't. Right. It's going to be this, you know, it's funny, you know, I drive to work every day and it's always, you turn on something, it's fear, doom. Yeah, you know, hey, right, we're, we're not right. going to have an election. The world's going to crash tomorrow. Right. We're going to see this. And everybody wait for this, wait for this, wait for this, wait for this. I drive to work every day. Car's driving. I see yeah. cars driving every, every day. I'm stuck in the same traffic. Everybody going to do the same jobs, doing the same things. Yeah. And I always think to myself, man, I just hope that everybody's got that purpose. Mm. I hope that you're driving to work, mm. right? Going to doing what you want to do and what you love to do. Yeah. Yeah. Because I haven't had that. I didn't realize how important that is because that fills my cup. Mm. Is when you're involved and you're in and you're doing something you truly love and is meaningful. And I see it in the every day. I connect with patients, the mothers and the fathers. And when they come there and they find what we're doing and they, it's just like, man, you know, this is it. This is where I'm supposed to be right now. Yes. Right now. Yes. Right now. What are some of the things you're opening their eyes to? Raw milk, yeah. uh, clean food, real food. Real food. Yeah. Brother, I tell you, you know, you talk about an evolution, right? <laughs> I gone from you're sick, here's your drug. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. And yeah. It, it, here, I'll save you some money. Here's your generic version of your drug. <laughs> right, Look how right. good I did today, guys. Right, I got my right. generic brand. Yeah. You know, um, to hey, just eat what you want, but exercise. Mm. You know, get your exercise in because that's the most important thing. Yeah. Right. To, well, you know, shop on the outer layers of the grocery store, you know. And if you can't get what you need, supplement it with vitamins mm -hmm. and and then get your exercise, yeah. right? I mean, this is just it, what it's like. Reminds me of those dance evolution videos, right? Oh, the evolution yeah. of dance. Yeah. It's like the evolution of Nick Bradley's thought in health, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Where'd you come from, man? Some archaic area. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, so it's too now where when patients ask me, what can I do to you know nourish my child? What can I do for a healthy lifestyle? 
And I no longer tell them to go to a grocery store. Mm. I said, you know, if you need your staples, go get your staples. You know, get your pepper, get yeah. your salt, get some of your spices. Um, but it's now you'll find your farmer or grow up. Yeah. And and what we can what we start when we actually talk about, I find myself, I've evolved from talking. I mean, we talk about how to make a meal. Like mm-hmm. I'm talking about bringing food together and and I've talked about farms I've met. I go out to farms, meet local farmers, I go out and meet uh, local growers. And we we build care plans around the community. Amazing. So, you know, when they come in and I, I say, hey, here's where you find your raw milk. Take a look. Here, here's what you can look at for that. Because I found, you know, this idea, what we look at in the functional side of medicine is this casein-free, dairy-free, casein-free, dairy-free. Right. Man, we are still plugged in. Yeah. And here's your supplements, right? right? Here's your supplements. Casein-free, dairy-free. Here's your supplements. It's the same paradigm. It's just the opposite side. I mean, we're 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 still the same bird, right? Yeah, Democrat, yeah. Republican, take yeah. your pick your poison. Exactly right. Because those synthetic vitamins, they're made from the same toxic garbage that the synthetics, mm. the pharmaceuticals are making. You start learning where those vitamins are made, it changes your idea about what vitamins are. Mm. It's chemicals. Right. In the end, it's chemicals. You know, when I asked a patient, I you know, one of the things we talk about in terms of nutrition and what it means to eat real food, right? Mm -hmm. And the simplicity and reductionism of man, that we can go in and we can extract what nutrient we need from that, give it to a human being, make him just as healthy, right? Um, Because even that history is flawed and that's a whole different thing. But if you think about what food is, if I take an orange, right? And I open that orange and I eat it. That orange is a symphony. When Mm -hmm. you go to a symphony, you have hundreds of different instruments, right? And you have a conductor. Right, that conductor for this purpose is God. Yes, for this absolutely, exercise. absolutely. He is bringing out yeah they, some of the most beautiful sounds you will hear when you're looking at all this. It's just you're inspired by yeah. the the awe. I mean, the massive amounts of instruments that are yes. going to make this music, and yeah. it just takes you in different frequencies and levels. Yes, that's an orange, mm. and God gave you that orange. There's the conductor. Here's what He's giving you that music. Mm. You tasted the citrus, the beauty, the feeling, the what takes that 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 orange flavor mm. that we yeah. have. You eat yeah. it, it's like, oh my God, that's beautiful. It's wonderful. What we've decided to do is, oh no, we can take from that. I can go to that symphony, and I can take the cello, I can take the violin, mm. I can take this piece, I can take that piece. There's your vitamin. Yeah. Here's your orange. You're getting the same thing from that orange. No, you're not. Mm. No, you're not. You can't put in a bottle and tell me that that right there is right. an orange, my That's friend. Right. Yeah. It's not the same thing. Until we get st- out of that paradigm and realize that food is our medicine and it's food, real food. Yeah. Did you do you know where it came from? Right. You have the positive energy that went into it, right? Yeah. We got into the mass industrial this industrialization of our food supply, right? Where we've basically uh, off, we've abrogated our responsibility to connect with what we consume, mm. right? With what makes us healthy and yeah. vibrant and alive. Yeah, we've given it to somebody else to do, but then we've we've capitalized on that. We've marketed it, and then we figured out how to mass produce it. Right. And by doing so, we're stripping it from the foundation of which it was grown and what made mm. it beautiful. And now, when you go to the grocery store, that's what you're buying. You're buying it stripped of that foundation. It can say organic, great. Now it's just as much. I love people who say I don't trust the government. You trust that organic label on there? Right. That is the government. Right. Right. So as much as you say, I don't trust the government, well, you're trusting that. So, you know, it's it's you talk to your producer. Right. When I can go to the farmer's market and ask them, how'd you grow this? Right. Where's your farm at? Can I look? Can I come see your farm? Mm. And they're like, Yeah, come out to my farm, come see our operation, awesome. see what we're doing. Awesome. When you talk to the producer that makes that dairy, same thing. Yeah. It's the same thing with milk. When you drink milk, we can we go in this casein free, casein free, casein free. Yes. There are some people that can't do it, yeah. but the vast majority can't do it because we turn it into toxic garbage. Yeah, I take a beautiful cow. I put him in a lot amongst other cows. I feed him garbage, right? Right? Feed him garbage. That's a sick cow. Right. But then I can take the milk from that cow, heat it to 170, 200 plus degrees. Say, okay, good. We got rid of all the contaminants. Here, here's your health. Right. Here's your health. Get your protein. Right. Get got, calcium. Got milk. Got milk. Yeah, oh, got but milk. didn't have vitamin D. I'm going to go ahead and inject synthetic vitamin D in it. Holy cow, Cipherol is going in there now so we can make sure it meets the standard that the real cow out to pasture in the sunlight eating grass will provide for you. And I will tell you, I see the difference every day in my children, mm. every single day. Every day I see them when they're on, moms come back and say, oh my gosh, he, he, he was dairy sensitive. Wow. We couldn't do dairy when I was pregnant. And when we gave him his first milk, he got sick. 
And now he's drinking raw dairy like it's going out of style. It's and amazing. He's vibrant. Amazing. Yes. Well, it's real food. Well, I was thinking about this the other day. I wanted to ask you, what do you think about goat's milk? Because yeah. a lot of people are doing dairy goats. And yes. that's a big movement because it's a little cheaper. Well, uh, and, yeah, and cheaper to Yes, it is. Yeah. It is. And you, you get a smaller protein, so it's uh, easier to digest. Oh, it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So goat milk is easier digestible than, mm. than cow dairy. Goat dairy is wonderful. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, you know, we think about, neuro, you know, medicine, right? Mother's milk, yeah, medicine, yeah, right, absolutely. Milk is medicine. You know, there was a there was a ward mm. I've read about, and uh, I think it was Johns Hopkins, but right? is it the Mayo Clinic or Johns Hopkins? One of these two, old. We're talking turn of the century, where they actually kept raw dairy products. It was medicine, of course. They kept it as medicine, of course. Yeah, you know, we we have we we have families treating uh, kids on the spectrum with raw camel milk. Wow, right. And they're seeing massive gains, wow. right? I don't need you to go out and conduct a double-blinded placebo-controlled trial, right. or randomized controlled trial. I don't need that. If I got a mama come and tell me my child's calm, right? He's talking, his vocabulary is increasing, he's opened up his his palate. What that right there, my friend, that's medicine. Mm. And we've we've told clinicians over the years, you know, the lowest, you know, we have this pyramid. Yeah. of what to trust in terms right. of study, right? Clinical observations at the bottom, the very bottom. No, don't trust your clinical observation. Mm. Trust the randomized or the meta-analysis of the randomized control trials that we looked at all over the time. Mm. Trust that trial. But are they going to conduct those trials in the United States with those kids right. doing raw camel milk or anything? No, they can do that. They'll never do that. You know, it's also someone said, when I was at the Home Centers of America conference um, a couple weeks ago, this uh, beekeeper was talking about the, he, he goes, I'm going to red pill you all on honey and that real honey bees go out and gather all the nectar of the field and then bring it back and they make honey. But a lot of people are having bees in their feet and them white sugar water. So he said, if you consume, I'm talking to all of us that were sitting there, if you consume sugar, it will destroy your immune system. Mm-hmm. And it's why bees are disappearing at, because they're getting, they're being weakened by the sugar water. But he said, you know, God intended to have a land of milk and honey. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what was like the promise. You get to go have a land of milk and honey. And I thought, well, that milk he's talking about is not pasteurized. Mm -hmm. It's not probably even cold, you know, Mm -hmm. that that honey Mm -hmm. they're talking about is the real medicinal, you know, Manuka honey, whatever is like, the real stuff, mm-hmm. you could live forever on that. Yes. The proteins of the milk and the honey and the sweetness and and the immunities you get from honey. Yeah, that's right. right. People, you know, I know I know beekeepers that that work specific treatments for uh those that have allergies. Mm. Right. You know, I always tell my patients that have allergies, make sure you're buying local raw honey. Yeah. Make sure it's from the area you live. So yeah. you're getting those pollens. Um yeah, no, it's 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 you know, it's like what I found with medicine, medicine, like medicine, uh, it's it's easy, but it's hard. Mm. It's in front of us. It's intuitive to us. What heals us, what makes us healthy, what makes us thrive. Yeah, yeah. But we've been beaten so much with chemicals right. that we've we've reprogrammed our brains. We've reprogrammed our instincts. We've reprogrammed all these, our taste buds, all mm. these things. It becomes a challenge. And mm-hmm. I find it so hard to get patients over from the the process, the commercialized right. world into, you know, just nourishing real food. And most often than not, I find, you know, most of my patients just don't have the faintest idea about nutrition at all, like just fundamental food groups, right. and what it means to not eat processed foods. So, you know, that, that, you know, starting from that point and then bringing them into the world of like, you know, let's talk about raw milk. They're looking at me like, who are you? Right. What are you talking about? Well, raw milk. No, totally. I'm sure. <laughs> and the funny thing is, the old dog, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the no, funny thing good. is, always say, you mean like what granddaddy drank? <laughs> like, yes. And you think exactly. there's some wisdom there? Right. You know? That old man's strength came from somewhere. Yeah, you know right? I mean? <laughs> it's like, yes, exactly what granddaddy did. Yeah. Well, as we as we wrap this up, so we're, we got to do many more. Yeah. I think this is like a series that we got to go. Have. We got to talk spirit. I want to go Holy Spirit pet talk with you. I'd love that. We have to. Okay. Yeah. For the parents watching that have no idea where to start. Yeah. You know, what should they do? Where should they go? What should they read? Like, where should they start? Wow. 
Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I think the first the first thing is stop fast food, stop processed food. That's it. Yes. If you can make those two changes alone, process. Yes. So what I mean by processed food, if you don't know what the ingredient is, don't eat it. Yeah. So if you look at the box, you read it, don't eat it. If you don't know, if you don't know any of those ingredients or what that is, then you shouldn't eat it. Yeah. So make it in your kitchen. Mm. Try to make it in your kitchen. There are wonderful cookbooks out there. You can do all sorts, even iterations. Like we have a cookbook that's a, a vegetarian cookbook. I'm not a vegetarian, mm, yeah. but I love her recipes. And I just add my meat, my protein yeah, to yeah, it. Yeah, right. Love it. So find something you like and then and then add what you enjoy to it. But I would say the big, the big takeaway would be get rid of the processed food. Mm. Get rid of the fast food. Correct your oils. Yeah. You got to correct what you're cooking, what you're eating in. Yeah. You got to fix your fats. Yeah. The two most important macronutrients, bar none, fat, protein. You got to fix that fat. And what they've convinced us of today is to eat the vegetable fat. It's convenient. Vegetable. How many times you squeeze kale and see you know, right. oil drip from that, brother? Right. Ain't there. Right. there. Ain't no oil in that vegetable. Right. So stay away from the vegetable oils. Correct your fats. Eat with grass-fed butter, ghee, beef tallow, yeah. uh, olive oil, coconut avocado, those are fruit. So use those as your bases mm. for cooking. If you can correct your oils, get rid of the processed foods, the fast foods, you're going to make a massive stride in what you consume. And even if you still shop in the grocery store, mm. even if you have to still eat the grocery store, I get it. Not everybody's got access to farmer's yeah, markets and right, farms right. and things like that. Even you got to go there and, and do the work at the grocery store, correct your fats. And then, you know, we can get far more nuanced in, into health, but that would be where I'd start. Limit your sugars. Mm. Look at your sweet sources. You just talked about honey, yeah. phenomenal source of sweet. Yeah. Ma pure maple syrup, yes. phenomenal oh, source man. of sweet. I can you can live on those two alone, right? Yeah. If you got to add a little coconut sugar here, I don't mind it. Again, you know the sweet component ease up on 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 the sugars. Yeah. yeah. So you don't want that, and definitely stay away from the refined stuff, the aspartames, the sucrose, the the right. the, the high fructose corn syrups. Stay away. Far away from those. Mm. Um, but those will be, I think, the modest things to start right there. And you'll find just eliminating your fast food is one of the hardest things, hardest feats they'll have. Yeah, that's right. Just getting rid of the fast food. Detox and all yeah, that. You're gonna stuff. Oh, yeah, you're going to detox. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you, you know, I would say go go read the in ingredients, guys. Don't just eat without in reading the ingredients. You've got to become an informed consumer in everything, right? We like to be informed. We like to think. We like to know. Yeah. I mean, everybody was on a big up and on, like, what's in the injections? Right. Well, buddy, if you're not even asking about what's in your bread, right. you know, what do you care what's in the injections? Because you're already putting crap in your body Great that's going to do just as much damage to your body in the long run. Great point. 444. I look at my phone. Um, synchronicity. I used to ask people I, when I give keynote talks, I said, how many of you would call yourself a good person? Raise your hand. Every, every hand went up. I said, what makes you a good person? Because you don't kill, you don't steal, you don't do horrific things. That doesn't make you a good person. That's just a baseline. Right. It makes you a human being. That's just, right. that's just you came out of the womb. <laughs> yeah. You know, right. what makes you a good person is what you do. <laughs> and I think what you're saying is we have to cease the bad, but that just gets you back to a baseline. Yes. And then start consuming that good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, no doubt about it. Because I yeah. think when you when you get involved with what goes in you, you'll be amazed at what comes out of you mm. and the thoughts it radiates and the feelings you have. Like the connections I make with farmers, you know, growing my garden, yeah. tending my chickens, doing my thing. Like there's there's something so magical, so spiritual to that that you take on an energy of that food. You feel that energy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's real. It's absolutely real. You take on that energy. And I think they, in Ayurveda, they call that the prana, mm -hmm. right? We, yeah, you yeah, know, there's, there's, there's energy, chi, chi, bro. Yeah. right. There's By energy. By the way, ener ener and the word energy mm -hmm. is inner chi. It's what it means, yeah. energy. Absolutely. That's just, amazing. That's what it is. So it's not woo-woo or yeah. you know, it's just... They know what the word means. It's in our, our inner chi, and they're trying to siphon our inner chi. So we have to rely on them for the dark chi that they're trying to give us, you know? Yeah. That's right. Inner That's chi. Right. Yeah. So take take on that, take on that. You know, and and you know, read the ingredients and know the ingredients. Mm. And you'll be surprised. You know, I my my coworkers, they'll go out and they they always ask me, Nick, what can I do? I got these these problems and this and yeah. this and this and this. And I'll say, guys, you know, it starts with your food. They can't correct it. Mm. They're addicted. And then, you know, they'll still come in every day. They'll bring in their Chick-fil-A's. They'll bring in their fast foods. And yeah. I'm like, guys, 
don't you know you're you're at you you're asking for it. You know your gut problems, the the, the headaches, right? The lethargy. It's there. I'll, I'll say as, as we wrap, when I was at the Homesteaders of America conference a couple weeks ago, and we talked about this at dinner the other night, there were 6,000 people that came from Canada and the U.S. It was incredible, this, this revival of humanity, mm. talking about processing rabbits and chickens and, and raw milk. And I mean, it was exactly what you're talking about. People are waking up. And I saw very few. I counted. I didn't count more than 10. I think it was eight. Out of 6,000 overweight people. Mm. People, they look like European. When I was in Europe, I didn't see Mm -hmm. any overweight people. Right. And that's not an exaggeration. I saw zero overweight people all throughout Amsterdam and Paris. Because they, I had an agriculture executive tell me that they would go full organic in Europe if it wouldn't mean that people would starve. That's how far Europe is caring about their food and what they're putting in their body. Mm -hmm. And in the States... We're just lost, but people are waking up. As my, as an mm-hmm. encouraging point, at the Homesteaders of America conference, I saw people are treating this vessel mm-hmm. as the honorable vessel of God's spirit, as it should be. Um, so, brother, I love you. We got to do more of yeah, these. And this is better. this is so good. Yeah. Um, everyone, I'm going to put Doctor Nick's information in the show notes. So, you got to check him out and reach out to him if you got questions. And this is one of many. Yeah, absolutely. Brother. I love you, brother. Thank you, man. Thank you. All That's right. Good. Thanks. Well, I will put Nick's uh, info in the show notes. Thank you again, brother, for coming on. That was amazing. I can't wait for our part two. Everyone, I send you so much love. Wherever you are, whatever you're going through, there's a lot of energy moving around. And yet the courageous souls are the ones that are increasing in stature, increasing in impact and influence. And I send you all love and blessings on this journey. I am Lucas Mack. This is the Lucas Mack Show. And I'll talk to you on the next episode. Thank you for listening. If you're struggling to break free and need support, go to my website at lucasmack.com. There you'll find resources like videos and eBooks and also information on how to work with me for coaching. Thank you again. And I'll talk to you soon.